In the next section, we'll explore the motion segments failing caudal to our instrumentation. The case at hand to illustrate this is uh, a 25-year-old Czech uh, female. She had a fusion done in her home country at age 16. Then for matters that are difficult to elicit, something was uh, felt to go uh, unbalanced and she received a Harrington rod fusion in her home country. She later immigrated to our country and she now has severe back pain and radicular pain with ambulation. Uh, the center cut shows a CT scan and on myelogram views you see that basically her foramen are, and her root uh, um, zones are cut off. Uh, the question I'd now like to uh, raise is uh, bring John uh, Smith up here again and discuss uh, why did this happen and how can this be avoided? You know, the classic treatment as we discussed earlier was T4 to L4. That's what Sherm Coleman taught me. It always works. It's never a problem. I didn't know Lynn Staley was the same way, but I've heard that before and they're of similar vintage. But the problem that you see in the long-term Harrington rod patients is really uh, this issue of flat back syndrome and a, a true sagittal imbalance. And certainly these patients are prone to have back pain and as would be predictable, caudal segment degeneration. There is a lot of uh, um, studies looking at long-term outcome of Harrington rod surgery, which was all we had, a big innovation at the time. Um, but certainly the, the literature would support that the incidence of low back pain is highest uh, in those patients who are instrumented to L4 or lower. And uh, what you see in these uh, patients as well is a lot of translational motion at the adjacent segment below the, the fusion. And those fused to L4 will have as high as 80% uh, incidence of retrolisthesis. L3, it's less, and above that, it's not as much of a problem. But if you look at patients who have retrolisthesis, the literature would support that there's a very high incidence of back pain. Um, if you look at the difference between fusing at L3 or above compared to uh, um, going lower, the L3 or below group certainly has a much greater incidence of late disc disease, higher back pain scores, more uh, requirements for uh, narcotics and pain medications and more problems with their activities of daily living. Um, if you look at function uh, uh, with long follow-up after uh, uh, fusions, certainly the fusion group seem to have much more pain than a control group of scoliosis with uh, no surgery. Surprisingly in, in the uh, um, Swedish literature where people seem to do better than everyone else, uh, they really didn't have significant differences, fusion versus control in their health-related re quality of life measures, and uh, there was really no difference in those uh, in function between L3 and L4, which is a little conflicting. And uh, if you look at the radiologic findings 22 years after uh, surgery done from the same uh, group, if you look at surgery in brace-treated patients, they had more degenerative disc disease and untreated controls, normal controls, but there really wasn't a big difference in the amount of degenerative disc disease uh, in this study if they were fused above L3 or below, which is again a little conflicting. So why does it occur? Well, it's presumed that it's a decreased motion in, in the, uh, mobile, the mobile segments versus the immobile segments that applies all the load um, at the uh, disc below the fusion. Certainly there's altered biomechanics to the spine. I think looking at the Harrington rod studies, it uh, seems to be a very significant problem with sagittal balance uh, contributing. And there may be other factors. It may be disease related to why they had scoliosis in the first place, and perhaps they're more prone than, than others uh, to have this problem. There are some uh, studies in the literature, animal studies, trying to look at how long fusions affect uh, things such as load at facets and motion at the facets. And they certainly would imply that a long fusion would have a significant altered load on facet joints and discs uh, in the adjacent, adjacent segments. So what are the current strategies to avoid it? Um, 
One is to do pediatric uh, spinal deformity and you avoid it altogether. Uh, <laughs> Having said that, really the, the strategy that we all use is related to um, trying to avoid instrumentation in the lumbar spine in the, the properly selected patient. And uh, there have been techniques such as selective thoracic fusion, anterior only fusion, and now more recently pedicle screw techniques that really uh, are advancing the ability to avoid uh, long fusions into the lumbar spine in some instances and also provide a uh, better thoracic uh, sa sagittal balance. So the guidelines for performing selective uh, fusion were again, you know, really uh, initiated by Howard King and then somewhat refined by uh, Larry Linke's uh, classification. And if you aren't uh, familiar with it or uh, use it regularly, um, it does look a bit overwhelming when you look at all the, the details, six types of curves. There's modifiers in the lumbar spine, there's uh, thoracic uh, sagittal modifiers and so forth. But it, as you work with it a bit, it actually becomes uh, um, somewhat helpful in trying to, p to select the patient who is a good candidate for selective thoracic fusion. This is a more simplified uh, look at it. And it's really the, the linky 1C curves, which would be equivalent to a king type 2 curve, a primary thoracic curve with a flexible uh, lumbar curve below where you're trying to make the decision about whether you can avoid instrumentation into the lumbar spine. It's somewhat helpful. The real uh, decision point in this is, is the, uh, um, the lumbar modifier A, B, and C, which really uh, determines how displaced the lumbar curve is uh, from the central sacral line and is, is somewhat uh, um, uh, a predictor of whether you can do a selective thoracic fusion. And a recent pa paper by Matt Dobbs out of St. Louis really said that if this curve is flexible below 25 degrees on a prone push film, uh, that you could sort of push the envelope. Um, the concern in doing selective thoracic uh, fusions is really trying to select the right patient. And uh, if you make the wrong choice, what you can find is that uh, you do a nice thoracic fusion and end up, as you can see in the uh, uh, middle film there, some uh, coronal decompensation, which uh, patients don't like, and uh, cosmetically is somewhat acceptable, and then occasionally have to extend your fusion down to get a satisfactory coronal balance. Um, another approach, one that I tend to lean for, is what I call selective thoracic fusion plus, which is to go one level below what the linky classification would recommend, and I find that Stopping a difference between stopping a fusion at T12 and L1 is, uh, as long as there's not junctional kyphosis, has very little impact on patient function. And uh, it's hard to say whether that's going to be true in terms of subsequent caudal segment degeneration. So do anterior techniques save fusion levels? This gets back to what we were talking about earlier where you know, there was a big wave of doing anterior surgery uh, through a large open thoracotomy to preserve motion segments in the, the lower spine. And a study published by Randy Betts in 1999 uh, said that anterior constructs saved approximately two and a half motion segments compared to posterior constructs. But this was really posterior hook rod constructs, which really didn't have the same uh, ability to neutralize the invertebrae at the distal end. More recent study uh, by Potter um, showed that posterior pedicle screw contracts were really equal to anterior surgery for these linky one curves. And it's interesting that when these studies, as we were talking about evolution of, of what people do versus what's in the literature, by the time this study came out, they were, Betts and their group was really studying posterior pedicle screw contract, constructs. So there's that lag time between what people publish and what they're actually doing. So what's it all mean? Well, I think we can safely say and support in the literature that modern instrumentation, it really seems to allow us to preserve more caudal motion segments uh, than we were able to do in the past with uh, hook rod constructs. And it's certainly equivalent to anterior techniques. And I think that preservation of this caudal motion may lessen the incidence of caudal segment degeneration, although I think um, with the improved three-dimensional uh, sagittal and coronal correction that we see with pedicle screws, I think we're really, it's still unclear whether 
20 years from now, as we're looking at Harrington rods, we're going to be saying the same thing about these uh, uh, more modern uh, instrumentation techniques. I think it's a question that will have to be answered. At least from a, a logical standpoint, it seems that uh, we're doing a better job. And really, this long-term follow-up will probably result in a very different talk at this course in 20 years. Thanks. There are things that can really break apart and fall apart, such as this uh, case uh, illustrates here uh, with a lumbar spine with multilevel spondylosis. And instead of a multilevel disc replacement, a multilevel fusion was performed. And yet, yet again, the junctional problem occurred. Uh, uh, the pelvis uh, fell apart somewhere below. It was recognized relatively late. Uh, again, seeing x-ray evidence of this can be very difficult. I'll ask Marcel Dvorak to identify reasons for this and how we can look into this. Marcel. Thanks, Jens. We have studied um, a certain group of our patients and looked at them and, and published this recently. And I, I think it's, it's really visionary the way this uh, symposium has been set up to look at, uh, you know, the blend between pediatric and adult and then look at rostral and caudal failure. Because I think caudal failure hasn't been addressed. It hasn't been discussed. And, um, and I think it's an area that's uh, certainly plagued my practice. So in the next um, 15 minutes or so, or 10 minutes, I've got nine points that I'd like to, uh, to touch on. I've, I've been asked to talk about causes, treatment, and prevention, and under each of those I have three sort of take-home messages that most of these come from our, our paper in spine and, and our, uh, our clinical experience. So first of all, let's look at causes of the caudal junctional failure. And the first is the susceptible host. And I don't think it's a mystery to anyone that the L5 pedicle is different from all the lumbar pedicles, all the other adjacent pedicles. It tends to be wider, it tends to be softer bone, maybe more patulous would be a, a term that comes to mind. And I think that predisposes patients to the kind of failure that uh, we're seeing here, where we see a stress fracture through an L5 pedicle, and again, that, that broad, wide, pedicle with, uh, with probably an undersized uh, screw in it. So I think the L5 pedicle anatomy is the first problem. And ending a fusion at L5, I always think twice now when I, when I end a longer fusion at L5. The next uh, point about this susceptible host or, or this susceptible bed for caudal junctional failure is osteoporosis. And we've seen a number of slides and we know about the, the decline in mean bone mineral density over age. We know that there are standards at every age and that that gives us a T-score and that, that we know within that standard deviation there are, there are people that are outliers. And, um, you know, I think it was Ted, that, Ted who said that anyone less than 2.5 uh, below, uh, you know, shouldn't be operated on. I've heard other surgeons say anyone with an aorta that's whiter than their vertebral body shouldn't be operated on. I've heard other surgeons say that we can operate on pretty much everyone, uh, even, even, um, even terribly osteoporotic spines, as long as we squirt a bit of cement in, in the vertebral body. Uh, I, I think we just need to be aware of this, and we need to be aware of the medical treatment of osteoporosis. Uh, and the, the other overlay on this is smoking and substance abuse. We, we found a huge, huge um, correlation between those that smoked and had failure within and at the caudal end of their segment. And um, I think the subs substance abuse issue may be more of an issue in Vancouver, but still more of an issue in the West Coast here than in the East Coast. Uh, is, is an issue related to compliance, and, and we found that to be a significant predictor of patients that, that ended up failing their uh, caudal motion segment. The, the last part of this susceptible host is highlighted by this patient who um, years prior had a, a in situ posterolateral uh, uninstrumented fusion from L4 to the sacrum and had a fairly decent relief of his uh, pain, though he never, never went back to work, continued to smoke uh, about a pack a day, uh, as well as smoking other substances. And then he developed this uh, failure above. And, and I fell into the trap and, and I made pretty much every mistake you can possibly make in treating this, this fellow. 
Um, he uh, initially had sacralization of L5. He had this posterior fusion extending to four. And this is an upright film that shows you what his <coughs> sagittal balance is. And, and when I see this now in my clinic, uh, this is nothing but trouble. This is a, a guy who's got an L5 pedicle that's patulous. He's probably fairly osteoporotic through that body. He's got terrible sagittal balance. Uh, and, um, and this is a, uh, a patient just uh, set up to fail caudally. The second issue that, that that case presents as well is the whole issue of sagittal balance. And I think we, we tend to focus on this x-ray, on, on the coronal plane deformity. And we're starting now, as a result of, of symposia like this, to focus a little more on sagittal balance. And people that are out of balance uh, are more predisposed to have caudal failure. I think more of us are doing 36-inch films instead of just these lumbar films that you see here. So that's another predisposing variable that's a cause of caudal segmental failure. The third cause is something that, that Ted brought up and, and elegantly presented to us. In our study, I think we had nine out of 13 patients that if they didn't have fairly advanced hip osteoarthritis to begin with, once they were fused to the sacrum, they developed severe degenerative arthritis of the hip. This is a woman here, uh, and this is an x-ray after I did, I think, about five revisions finally fusing her to the sacrum. After she pulled out her L5 screws, she pulled out her S1 screws, she then fractured through her sacrum, and then I revised her down to the sacrum, finally got her balanced, and she comes back to my office walking like this. And I, I looked at her x-ray, it was fine, and then I went back and, and actually examined her um, which is a neat trick to do, is examine the patient after you, you can't make an, uh, an x-ray diagnosis. And this was, her, uh, this was her AP pelvis. That's the next mobile joint after iliac fixation, so we need to remember that. So those are the, the sort of three issues around cause. Now let's move on to treatment. And as far as treatment of caudal junctional failure is concerned, I think the first area is recognition. And, and we haven't recognized it as well as we could, and I don't think we've looked for it as well as we could. This is that same patient uh, who, who had the degenerative osteoarthritis of the hip. So this is her initial degenerative scoli here. This is her lateral. And notice how I have a, a short film there. I don't have a 36-inch standing film for the lateral. And this is my post-op. You know, I did that thing where I walked out of the OR, slid on both knees, and did a double pump after doing this. I thought I did a great job. And, uh, you know, I thought we had very good restoration of lordosis through that uh, fusion. I thought that we had good coronal restoration. I was generally happy. And look at what happened fairly quickly and with minimal mobilization. I, I think this happened within about a month. She fractured through her L5 pedicle. These screws levered down through the L5 body and just cut through it like cheese. And she ended up with this terrible coronal deformity. She was then extended lower and we failed to provide anterior interbody fixation here and that's another issue I'll bring up. Uh, she ended up with multiple operations to finally get her back in balance. And uh, many of these, and this patient included, we uh, ended up salvaging by doing a pedicle subtraction osteotomy through the failed level and through the fractured level. So that's the second issue on, on treatment. But I think I've been much more careful in looking at my x-rays at this lowest level. Here's another patient that had a two-level degenerative spondylo that we did front and back. And look at the distance between the inferior and L5 end plate here on his immediate uh, post-op, you know, standing film in hospital. And then he comes back, he's decompensated, and look at what's happened. That L5 screw has just cut through the body. And looking for that, recognizing it, I think is the, the first step in treating it. Here's another example of a patient where that cage has just cookie-cuttered right down into the end plate, and those screws have just levered through, um, through bone. 
And the, uh, the method of salvaging most of these for us and, and the workhorse procedure here has been the pedicle subtraction osteotomy, usually done uh, taking advantage of the fracture, usually done through that segment where the fracture occurs. And um, this is, uh, is kind of like being embarrassed in a uh, change room. I don't, I don't want Jens to, to comment on the size of those screws down there. But really, a PSO, a, a PSO, with extension to the uh, to the pelvis, is uh, is the way to salvage these. This is a patient that uh, Steve Onder and I were discussing. It's a patient of his, who had uh, Parkinson's disease, and this was his. Uh, it's labeled pre-op, but it's actually post-op after caudal segmental failure, salvaged with a PSO through L5 and extended down to the ilium. And um, uh, that uh, PSO is a workhorse operation. The third issue around treatment, and Jens and I discussed this at NAS, I think, about a year ago, is post-operative mobilization. This is a kyphosis generator. If you decide you want to create kyphosis at the caudal end of a fusion, if you want to try and rip someone's screws out, you design a bed like this. And that's what our hospital beds all look like. And what do the nurses do? The first day post-op, they'll crank up the head of the bed, or now it's electric, so patients can do it themselves. They slide back into the bed, and it puts a tremendous forward bending stress on the spine. And, and I think that maybe the way we nurse a lot of our patients post-op leads to that forward flexion deformity. Uh, here's an example you know, of a, a picture of someone just sort of propped up in their overall kyphotic uh, posture in bed. It's terrible. And then just to make things worse, once we get them up, what do we do? We put them on walkers and get them leaning over, holding all these different devices. And, and I think this is uh, a kyphosis generator as well. And for a few of these patients that I've revised at, at Jens's suggestion, I've nursed them prone for a while and I've forbidden them from using walkers. And uh, I know I've irritated the allied health staff in our unit, but I think it makes a difference in the attention we pay to post-operative mobilization. So finally, and we're on the, the final stretch here, prevention. And there are again three, three aspects to preventing this deformity. Extent of fusion, how low should you go? And, and this, is, this is where I think we are starting to get some guidelines on, you know, where, where do you fuse to? Do you go to L4? Do you go to 5? Do you leave a long, long fusion in someone who may not be that well balanced sagittally dangling on these L5 pedicle screws? Or do you go to the, uh, the sacrum or out to the ilium? And these are the questions that I think we need to, to answer. And we're starting to get uh, some answers or at least some guidelines. And th this is what I've learned. And I won't present all the evidence because there isn't any, but, but this is just sort of my gestalt. When you have degenerative discs or facets below a level of fusion, you've got, you can't leave that. You've got you've to go through that. If you have long constructs, a construct that goes above L2, really stopping that at L5 is, is asking for trouble. Um, I would go to the sacrum in, in that patient. Anyone with neurodegenerative disease, we've got a couple patients with Parkinson's who have movement disorders. Uh, they put tremendous stress on their fusions without, uh, without doing anything. And I think in those we have to extend the fusions lower. We've talked about osteoporosis and we've talked a bit about sagittal imbalance and the effect sagittal imbalance has on, on that lower part of the fusion. Be surprised how many scoliosis patients have a concomitant spondylolisthesis at 5-1 that may not be recognized and may not factor into the treatment. Do you just go to the sacrum? Do you just put screws in S1 and, and out into the ilium or do you go down to the pelvis? and use these, these large iliac wing screws? Well, I think that depends a bit on bone quality. It depends a bit on whether you have interbody fixation at L5-S1. It depends a bit on whether there's a spondylo, but I think the, the biggest issue is the sagittal balance.
if the patient's sagittal balance is out by more than four or five centimeters, then, uh, then we will go to the ilium because there will be a lot of stress on that segment. Here, is, uh, here are sort of my indications for putting iliac screws in and fusing to the ilium. Long segments, osteoporotic patients, a high-grade spondy, so that if you have a patient that you're correcting and pulling back, you really need that lower fixation to hold them. Sagittal imbalance anticipated, coronal imbalance anticipated, or they have a prior pseudarthrosis at 5-1. The other, the other finding that I've found is that um, a, um, a PLIF or a T-LIF does not necessarily lordose. And um, my, my not equal signs are a little out of, uh, out of sync here. But uh, I'm surprised at how little lordosis we get through a PLIF or T-LIF. And even though we try, we, we really try, we don't get quite as much lordosis as we think. And so be aware that you're maybe not lordosing as much as you think you are within your fuse segment. And then, as well, regardless of how much lordosis you think you're getting through your fusion, you may not be sagittally balancing the patient. So you may think you've got very curved rods that you've put in. It may look very lordotic, but on the table you don't know what their sagittal balance is. And I haven't quite figured out how to do that. On a table with a small cassette, figure out whether they're sagittally balanced. And I, I think someone showed some x-rays of the pelvic incidence and the, the center of the femur and how that aligns. I think the secret might be somewhere in there, but I, haven't, uh, I certainly haven't figured it out. So lordosis in your construct does not equal sagittal balance. And this again is that same patient that I keep showing, the one with the scoliosis that I extended down to the sacrum and failed to provide anterior interbody fixation at L5-S1, and this is the third and final point. I, I think you absolutely need interbody support at 5-1, and we went back after she failed and ripped all her screws out and failed through that disc yet again and ended up walking in a position where you could set a T-service for four on her butt because she's so far forward. And she comes back to my clinic and I just cringe when I see her. And then finally we, uh, I think, got it all right. Got some interbody support in there. Uh, got her balanced, got her hips done. I mean, there, there is nothing else that can go wrong in this patient. <laughs> oh! <laughs> I, just, I just felt a dark cloud go over. <laughs> So um, thanks again for, uh, for inviting me. I appreciate the invitation, and I hope that uh, my grief will lead to some less grief on uh, your part. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you for coming here. Thanks.